Um, my name is Dean McEwen. I'm the director of the MMA Blended Cohort uh, at here at Smith School of Business. So um, thank you very much for joining me today to learn about the MMA program. Um, as we enter our 10th year of the program, actually, which is pretty exciting. We've been doing this for a long time. And um, as you can imagine, there's been uh, a few iterations, basically, you know, as technology advances too, we, we change the program every three years or so. So um, we're going to be uh, looking at a curriculum review probably in the next 12 months as well, and sort of in honor of the 10th anniversary and the way we go. Um, Okay, just uh, just a couple of logistics pieces. Um, I'm joined by uh, Betsy Smith, who's our application advisor, and Betsy's going to be monitoring the Q&A. So if you have any questions that pop up um, during the, uh, the webinar, uh, please enter them into the Q&A, and uh, Betsy will try to answer them as quickly as possible. And then if there's any that she's um, feel saved for, you know, the the audience, basically, or everybody, um, I will answer those sort of at the end of this webinar. Okay, so let's uh, let's start with uh, a land acknowledgement. So um, land acknowledgements are a way that people sort of insert and build an awareness of Indigenous presence and land rights in our everyday lives, in as particularly in Canada. Um, they recognize the history of colonialism and First Nations, as well as the need for change in settler colonial societies. Uh, because I'm the director of the, the blended program, I started to sort of research where indi which Indigenous communities I should include in my land acknowledgement. Uh, the thing about the blended program is that it includes students from across Canada. I mean, literally, uh, the classes touch all three oceans. And so... Um, this map uh, is basically what I discovered, um, you know, the depth, the breadth, and the reach of Indigenous communities across Canada. Um, so instead of just calling out a few, you know, that we spend most of our time on, um, I want you to, you know, think a little bit more critically and comprehensively about Indigenous history, you know, especially where, you know, you live and you learn and you play on a daily basis. You know, I'm asking you to sort of think about and discover, you know, which Indigenous lands you live on. And what do you know about this territory? What do you know about the culture of your local Indigenous communities? Um, so I also encourage everyone to read and develop an understanding of the 94 calls of action identified in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's findings. I personally have made um, every effort to learn about these actions. And I know that I personally can make a difference by supporting call number 57, which is learning about Indigenous peoples, and not only educating myself, but encouraging others to learn, as I'm doing right now, um, to learn about them as well. And although I'm not an expert, you know, I'm happy to share the resources that I used in my own um, sort of journey and discovery. Uh, the other one is the, the 93rd call of, to action, which is particular to newcomers coming to Canada. Um, I want to encourage you to learn about the Indigenous people in Canada and learn about their traditions and the ways of knowing as you build uh, a new life here in Canada. Okay, now let's get on with analytics. So Smith School of Business, uh, I mentioned at the top there that we've been literally running this MMA program for 10 years. Um, and through those 10 years, we've actually developed quite an extensive ecosystem around analytics. Analytics came out of operations research and operations management. And we've actually, you know, identified sort of the need and particularly the business need for more analytics and understanding digital transformation of organizations. So through that, uh, we've built out this ecosystem and you know, all of these academic programs, we've got the MMA program, we've got a master's of management in artificial intelligence, we've got research-based MSCs and PhDs in analytics, and we also have non-research executive education programs as well. And what keeps us in the know, basically, and understanding what's going on, uh, especially with technology and analytics, is we have a number of applied research centers and research labs as well. And so all of our faculty are engaged in this applied research part and making industry connections as well. So we work in partnership with a lot of different companies across Canada and around the world and helping understand 
not only analytics, but how do you apply it? How do you make a difference in your uh, decision making in your organization? And this is what leads us to the MMA degree. Okay, so we call this a business degree. We're a business school offering a relatively technical program, um, but the program itself is a full master's degree that you take in 12 months. Uh, but it is a master's degree. So this is not the kind of program that you're just gonna pay your money and, and get a certificate or a piece of paper at the end of it. Um, you can expect a lot of academic rigor throughout the program as well. Uh, some of our courses do have exams. There's always assignments, there's team projects, there's lots and lots of presentations and opportunities to develop your communication skills. And also uh, this program is a, what we call a team-based program. Okay, so we put you onto a team for the entire program and about 50% of all your assessments will be team-based. Now, what we do when we build teams in this program is we actually, well, we're gonna run you through some personality tests and stuff and we're gonna understand who you are, how you think, how you behave, how you interact with other people. And we're going to use that information to build teams that are extremely diverse. Okay. And diversity involves a lot of different variables, such as, you know, not only age and gender, uh, but educational background, current job roles, those personality test results that we've got. And we're going to put you onto these super diverse teams and uh, make you work because diversity leads to creativity. And we want to understand and hear about those different ideas that different types of people have. And when you think about data and analytics, right, everything can be interpreted very differently by different people. And so no one has the right answer all the time. And so we want to be able to hear those different ideas and stuff in this sort of team environment with this program. And so to make things a little bit easier in that environment, we provide every team with a coach. And these are professional, what we call high-performing team coaches. And these coaches work with you and your teammates um, throughout the program. So they get a really good understanding of who you are and how you behave as a person. And they know that same information for all your teammates. And then they're going to work with you, you and your teammates as a single entity, right? Working and coaching that team. And this is a very important part about learning how to work with other people and, and most importantly, how to be successful and how to communicate effectively and how to make the proper pitches and get the job done as a team um, when it counts the most. The other uh, interesting thing that's come out as we sort of pulling up out of the pandemic situation is that we now have um, MMA offered in two delivery formats. So there is the in-person in classroom experience in Toronto. And then we also offer it as a blended program as well. And I'll talk about those later. Okay, what this is, this is an opportunity for you to really launch your career, right? And understand sort of, again, who you are and your strengths and your weaknesses and how do you build on those strengths and how do you overcome your weaknesses? And again, that's where the, the coaching is going to come into play and you're gonna have an opportunity to both practice your communication skills and developing these stories that you're gonna work and it's gonna really help out with your career. Now, what, what is analytics and what's this all about and what does this program actually teach you? So this is an important screen and uh, unfortunately we're in a two dimensional situation, but I like to think of that triangle more of a pyramid. Um, and at the bottom of the pyramid is that foundation of verified and trusted data. So, you know, you can't even think about doing any analytics or certainly not any AI implementation without knowing what kind of data you've got to work with and making sure that it's been verified and trusted. Because once you develop a computer system that's starting to make decisions for you, if it's making those decisions based on wrong data, then you're in a heap of trouble, right? You're gonna be having computer systems making a thousand decisions in a second and they'll all be wrong. So we wanna have that foundation of um, trusted data. And then we progress through and start analyzing that data, right? And we've got four different types of what we call progressive analytics. And then ultimately what that comes up to is at the top of the pyramid where we get into artificial intelligence and automated decision making, which is where we want to be. We don't want people to get involved um, in making decisions when we can make a computerized decision very, very quickly. And we don't need to be bogged down by people being involved with that. 
Now, what is analytics? And these are all the different types of analytics that we're going to be talking about in this program. Um, each of them is equally important. You can't, you know, you can't think of a digitally transformed organization without understanding each of these types of analytics. But I do call them progressive because they do go into that automation part. But we'll start with a descriptive analytics. And many people are probably familiar with that with things like dashboards and stuff. Descriptive analytics is what happened, right? How many widgets did we produce this month? Um, which is great information, right? But no manager is happy with what happened. They want to know what's going to happen. And so that's where we get into predictive analytics and think about predictive modeling. We actually have a whole course specifically identified as predictive modeling um, because these models um, are extremely important to understand what will happen or at least to map it out. The kicker with predictive analytics though is inherently most models are wrong. Um, you know, there's going to be something like a pandemic or like a currency fluctuation or something like that that's going to make your model less than useful. So what we want to do is get up into prescriptive analytics. And this is really about optimization and how to make it happen. So you've developed your model. You know what your current capabilities are. How do you make it happen? And this is where business decision making really comes into play. Um, usually the, the biggest or the most common sort of example of prescriptive analytics is dynamic pricing that we talk about. And dynamic pricing, when you think about airlines and hotel rooms, um, you know that the person sitting beside you or sleeping in the room beside you probably paid a different price um, for that room than what you paid. And with prescriptive analytics, you can understand the information about, you know, how many rooms in the hotel are available at one time. You can look at past customer data and customer behavior to understand what times of years those rooms are going to be in demand, what times of years they're not in demand, how many people join, when it's family travel, when is a business single person travel, and all that information. And that can actually have a very positive effect on your pricing. And the whole thing is like when you think about a hotel, uh, every time a room has not been booked, that is lost revenue. So at some point, right, it makes sense to lower the price for that room when your supply is bigger than your demand, lower the price to increase demand. And that way, every time you fill those rooms and every night that those rooms are all full, that's gonna increase your revenue, which hopefully increases your profit margins and stuff. So this is where we get into prescriptive analytics. You're really optimizing the use of that hotel. And then again, self-learning and automated artificial intelligence gets into what we call cognitive analytics. And that's where you're developing a system, a computer that actually kind of thinks like a person. But it's a little bit more than that. When you think about machine learning and stuff, um, what you want to be able to do is look at all that past data that I was just talking about with prescriptive analytics and developing a computer system that can not only analyze that data in real time, but actually make a decision and offer a specific price immediately to people who are browsing and looking to book a hotel room on the internet, for example. And these are the different types of analytics that we're going to talk about in the program. Now, the program itself, okay, I, and this, I can't sort of emphasize this enough, is that um, we are a business school offering a technical program, okay? So we've got this different sort of an approach to what we're trying to do here. Uh, I would argue that if you are in a computer science program, the computer science program would talk about the technology and say, okay, this is natural language processing. This is the data you're gonna need to do that. This is how you actually implement it. What we do in a business school is we take a step back and forget about the technology at the beginning. What we wanna do is understand what the problem is that this business is faced with. Why are they looking to investigate or researching technology? Because there must be a problem they're trying to solve. And we wanna get down to what we'll call the root cause analysis of that problem. And then once we understand the problem, then we're gonna develop a hypothesis and say, okay, well, how am I gonna solve this problem? And what do I believe is going to happen once I do my analysis? And at that point, you start thinking about the algorithms, the technology you wanna use. And then you're gonna do your analysis and then you're gonna look at that analysis. Does it meet your needs? Does it match the hypothesis that you expected it to? And you're gonna reiterate that investigation and that what we'll call scientific method to figure out if you've got enough information, right? To make an actual business decision 
um, based on your analytics and based on your machine learning system. So this is what we're looking at in here. So it's a bit of a, a broader approach, but actually at the same time, it's a bit more specific because you're trying to help a business make a decision. And then this program is, you know, I already mentioned that it's a team-based program. And so it's going to give you that opportunity to learn how to work very effectively with people, right? I've always said you can do the best analysis in the world, but if you can't communicate what it does or where it fits into the organization, it's never going to be implemented. It's going to scare people away and they're going to say, yep, yeah, maybe later. Um, and so this is an important concept of this program is developing not only the technical side of you, but also your business side and your communication side. And this is where we get into what we call developing business leadership um, through these experiences and the coaching that we offer. Now, the course itself or the program itself, um, we basically divide our courses into three different buckets. Um, we have what we call method courses where we teach you how to do analytics. Then we have application courses where we teach you how to do analytics apply to certain areas like marketing, operations and supply chain and finance. And then we have power skill courses as well. But in between, we offer you a couple of electives here. You get to choose one of the two, either analytics project leadership or entrepreneurship and innovation. So depending on your personal goals and, and where you wanna go and where you wanna take your analytics learning. Um, if you wanna do something on your own, start a new company, a lot of people have great ideas. And um, you, know, you take the entrepreneurship and innovation course and you'll learn actually how to do that effectively. Or if you're more into um, you know, corporate living or project leadership and consulting, then you've got the analytics project leadership course that can help guide you through to make sure you keep those projects on task, on budget, and on time. And then the, the power skill courses themselves are, are you know, again, going back to our business school roots, right? So we want to look at AI and ethics. You want to make sure your computer systems are making the right decision that meets the ethical and the morality uh, components of your organization. We also have leading change because this is a time of intense, intense change in all organizations and in society itself. So leading change and understanding how you can have a positive impact when you're trying to transform your organization digitally is extremely important. And then we also have an introduction to management course. So that's right at the very beginning of the program. And that really helps you, you know, formulate your mind around what I would call, you know, formal business education, understanding management, how it fits in, how do we do this, a bit of theory in there, but also it's pretty broad. Um, that course gets into finance, gets into um, marketing, gets into uh, operations as well. So you get sort of a quick introduction to all those areas before you go into all those method courses and the application courses as well. Okay, now talking about the in-person format in Toronto. So it's really important for people here uh, on the webinar today because the um, we are accepting applications for the spring start. And in that program, their first uh, opening session uh, starts at the end of April. I think it's like April 28th and it runs for a full week. So um, if you're thinking about that one, you know, I encourage you to sort of get your application in as soon as possible and get through that process because once we get the information, we'll run you through an interview and um, we want you to be all set up. But that date is coming up fairly quickly. So I encourage you to do that, um, particularly for domestic students. Um, you know, there's a great opportunity to get in there and get done because uh, there's a, there seems to be a lot of jobs still in the data and analytics side. I know we hear a lot of rumors about the tech world um, sort of shrinking, um, but in analytics and, and it's about the decision making that companies are doing, uh, they've all got the data. They don't have the people that can analyze the data. And so it's, it's really important to get started on your career, if you're, especially if you're making a switch and want to learn this stuff. Um, the, the program structure, it's, oh, I should say also for international students. So my understanding is that there's been some delays in getting uh, uh, work permit or not work permits, but educational permits uh, and study permits to come to Canada. So um, make sure if, if you're thinking in your head, right, that you want to start the program in April, make sure you check and find out what the times are for those permits, because um, 
study permits and in some cases have been like four months to get them, which means that April is no longer um, uh, good for you. So uh, you wouldn't be able to start the program until next January uh, in Toronto. So take a look at that. Uh, I still encourage you to get your application in there as quickly as possible, because I know you can apply for the study permit as soon as you get that offer from us. And so, you know, there's always a chance that you'll get that work permit. Um, the government is working towards decreasing that time. And so I encourage you to start the process as early as possible. Um, so basically what we do with this program is uh, we have two start dates. So we have a winter session, which is literally starting next week. Um, so of course you're too late for that one, but the, uh, there is an April spring session starting up in a couple of months. Um, basically you do one night every week in class. It's usually from 5.30 to 9.30 or so, plus weekend, one weekend day, bi-weekly for a full 12 months of the program. Uh, our office or our classrooms are downtown Toronto, uh, right across the road from the Metro Toronto Convention Center and right beside the CBC building. So it's really close to public transit, subways, go, all that kind of stuff. So it's very convenient for you to get there. And there's also two one week sessions that are held at Queens in Kingston. So these are an opportunity for you to not only take full courses in a week, but also to interact in a, what I would say, more social and more sort of focused environment as well, because you can, you know, not have to worry about taking out the garbage or walking the dog and all those kinds of things. You can really focus on your studies and your teammates during those sessions. And um, quite honestly, they're very social, a lot of fun, great networking opportunities. And again, we have the ongoing coaching, networking, and a full suite of career support for you as well. Now, the, the blended learning format, which I'm the director of, uh, we have one start date each year, which is in January. So my first opening session is actually in two weeks time. So it's right after MMA Toronto. Um, once they leave, then our gang moves in. Uh, this is, it's a, like I say, blended learning format. So most of the courses are online, except for we have two one week sessions, an opening one and a closing one. Opening session is in Kingston, closing session is in Toronto. Um, but basically all the courses in between are all online. So we use Zoom for what we call synchronous lecturing. So there's still lectures, you're still in a class with a professor, um, but you can take them from anywhere you are in the world. And that's why at the beginning of the, uh, this webinar, I mentioned that we have students across Canada and we do have some students around the world as well. So if you're an international student um, and you don't want to move or immigrate to Canada, um, and we have had quite a few students do this uh, and they want to take the program, they can take it from their home country. That's not a problem at all. Um, you just have to be able to travel to Kingston or to Canada for those two one week sessions. Uh, the blended learning format still has uh, the coaching is still team based and you still get the same levels of career support and all that kind of stuff, too. So um, as far as program structure goes, there's actually not that much difference between the, the in-person one and the blended one. Uh, it's just that you don't have to go to a physical location each week. Um, and I've mentioned before that this is, uh, you know, we're a business school offering a technical program. So we have a number of programming language tools that we use. Um, we are, um, you know, we're focused on Python these days as far as programming goes. And um, we've kind of moved away from R a little bit because Python seems to be, well, there's a couple of reasons. So one is that it's definitely been the primary programming languages for most organizations that we've been working with. A lot of them have given up on the R. Um, so we've got Python going on, but we also have other tools in our in our toolkit, put it that way, with Tableau, Databricks, SQL, Snowflake, SAS, Enterprise Miner, and Via. Um, and we got a lot of different opportunities. So what we'll do is we won't specifically teach about these tools in the program, but these tools are available to you as a student to use at your leisure. So if you really want to push, you know, Snowflake or Databricks, because you know that those are two of the leading sort of cloud-based infrastructures for people, um, you can sort of focus on that and encourage your team uses Databricks, for instance, to share your code and share your data and that kind of stuff. So um, we'll offer computing power and computing time for both Databricks and Snowflake.
Now, who's teaching you, right? So this is the other part. Um, we do have some outstanding faculty at Smith School of Business, and we've been able to pull them in to teach in this program as well. Um, we do, we have extremely high standards of who we're going to pick to help teach in the program. Um, there's this, you know, most faculty in business schools also have a lot of like consulting and management experience outside of academia. And so this is a great opportunity for you to interact with these people to learn not only about analytics and about some of the theory and some of the application of analytics, but also understanding what actually goes on in the world, right? What, what happens what, in this organization, you know, whether it's like Ford or Bell or Rogers or one of the big banks, um, all that information, our faculty have strong connections in the industry. And so they're, uh, they bring that into the classroom as well. And most importantly, actually, um, over the past 10 years, we've had this amazing analytics and AI advisory board. So it's currently chaired by Mark Schaefer, who's senior vice president of Disney Decision Science Integration at the Disney Company. Um, and so this group keeps us honest, put it that way. It, it, you know, I also mentioned the top there that, you know, we change the program basically every three years. And this, uh, these changes come from this advisory board. These people are the ones who say, whoa, 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 you know, we're not using R anymore. Why are you teaching R? Um, and so they're the ones who keep us on track and make sure that our students and our graduates are right in line um, with what is needed in industry now. And um, we just had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with this gang, and uh, it, you know, every time we meet, it's it's a wonderful experience, and we get some great insight from them about what's happening actually in the industry and what the direction is. And this allows us to make these sort of moves quickly, right before you know the general population kind of knows what's going on. So uh, we've been able to apply different things to the program uh, ahead of when it's needed so that when you're out there looking for work, you're ahead of the game. Now, as a student at Smith, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for you to get involved in. And this is both the in-person class and the blended program. We run a number of technical workshops. So if you wanna beef up your Python, SQL, Tableau, SAS, uh, we've got workshops for you. If you wanna develop your personal stuff, uh, your personal behaviors, your, your career advancement, we've got communications workshops and difficult conversations, for example, and a number of other workshops. There's a number of clubs you can get involved in. There's uh, also student leadership opportunities. So each cohort has its own sort of governance structure uh, where students say we have a class president, we have a class team that runs events um, and just acts almost as a liaison between the administration of the programs and the students themselves. And uh, also organizing social events and stuff. How do you get together with people? We have a, a Smith Business Club, which is like an alumni network for analytics and AI specifically. And there's a subgroup of that called Women in Analytics that can uh, you know, particularly uh, run speakers and panels um, geared towards women as they go into you know, this so, somewhat technical fields. Um, there's also a few cross programs. So that when you say cross program, that's you know, our MBAs, we've got 14 different programs here at Smith. And so, We've got a number of clubs that go across those 14 programs. So um, we have our Scotiabank Center for Customer Analytics, which runs a number of um, uh, like community seminars and challenges. We've got QA, which is the Queen's University Alternate Assets Fund, which is like a hedge fund that uh, uses real money. And they've got about six or seven hundred thousand dollars that they play with each year. Uh, and that's an opportunity you can imagine um, data is involved with that. It's not just the finance and the MBA folks anymore. Uh, there's a lot of people involved with uh, data analytics and understanding that. So they're very helpful. And we also have a club called Equity, Diversity and Inclusivity. And uh, again, um, that EDI club, they run a number of uh, guest speakers and, and panels and things. And these are opportunities that you as a student at Smith can get involved in. And I encourage you to do so too. Now, who are you in class with? So um, it's interesting, the cohorts are almost exactly the same every single year. We're always talking about the average age is 32, but the range is what I find most important. So we get some, some younger people. There is a, you know, a minimum two years of work experience required for this program. So 
Uh, when people are coming in at 22, generally what they do is they've already been doing analytics in their undergrad for a couple of years. They've been doing some internships and co-ops. They probably have a good, either a new company that they're working on um, or some kind of really impressive experience that they bring in that says, oh, we want this person in the program. And then at the other end of the range, from 52, we've got people who are you know, they're seasoned business leaders. They've been doing this for a long time. They know how to run a, a department or a company and they want to learn about analytics and they want to learn about data. They don't want to be left behind. So they want to come in here, learn what's going on. And then when you think about what happens there, you put these uh, older people and younger people on a team together and they can actually learn from one another, right? Because the younger people come in, they've, they're recently students, so they usually know what it's like to be a student, how to work effectively in an academic environment. Um, but more importantly, they have the technical skills, right? They understand what's going on with social media. They have a better understanding of things like, you know, TikTok and, and, um, and that kind of stuff and programming as well. They've probably been programming for several years. And so, you know, they can help the older people with the technical part and the older people can help mentor the younger people in understanding the politics and the business of what goes on in the office and that kind of stuff. How do you get things done? How do you put together a presentation for a business environment? That kind of stuff. So there's, uh, there's a lot of value in this and in the team structure of the program. Now, as a student as well, you have access to our career management framework. Now, one thing at Smith, um, basically what we do is we have the same career team for all of our programs. We don't have a specific one just for our MBA programs or just for our commerce students. It's the same one, the same group of coaches, the same environment, the same job boards, same everything. So uh, you have access to this. So you can learn about, you know, Bait more, what I say, more basic things like learning how to do a resume, how do you write a cover letter, how do you interview in this new crazy world? Because a lot of companies are coming up with new types of interviews where there's puzzles and tests and all this kind of stuff and coding opportunities. And so they're going to help literally coach you through that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's also, you know, those basic things like job boards and job searches and recruitment. And, you know, I always kind of tell people that, you know, if you see a job on there that you really like and you're interested in it, the first thing you should do is call up a coach, call your career coach and say, hey, can we meet and talk about this opportunity? I want to make sure that my application is as strong as possible and that I've got everything covered before I get into it, because that's really important. It's important to have a very strong presence right from the very beginning. And um, our team of career coaches is awesome. And they're making connections with companies all the time, especially in the analytics and AI space. There's tons and tons of jobs available for people. Okay, and um, you all also have an opportunity to work on some professional certifications. Um, what this does, though, this is kind of a, it, it's part of a tricky part because our program does not give you all the expectations to achieve these certifications. Okay, there is work outside the program that you're going to have to do. So, for example, for the PMI um, certification, right, the CAP M. Uh, there is work experience requirements for that. There is exams to write, uh, but our program or project leadership course specifically does provide you with 28 hours of instructional time, which is required for PMI. Uh, the same thing goes with SAS certification, right? SAS is great. Um, we'll give you that environment so you can learn about SAS, but you are responsible for writing the exam and passing that exam and getting SAS certified, right? So there, and the same thing with informs. There's always, uh, you know, we'll give you the framework and, and the foundational pieces towards these certifications, but you are still responsible for doing that. You don't get them just because you're a student in our program. Now, getting back to our admissions requirements. So um, this is a master's degree. So you do need to have an undergraduate degree from a recognized university. Uh, analytics, um, is about math and stats, right? We're gonna expect you that you're coming into this program with a, a certain level of knowledge of math and stats. So we're gonna be looking for those courses in your undergraduate and on your transcript to make sure you know that, you know, things like linear regression and, and how to apply it and stuff. We just need to know that you know that kind of stuff. Um, minimum two years work experience, 
Uh, we do accept a few people without that work experience, but uh, it's very, very limited. And we want to see you do have experience in analytics and in research and in these kinds of projects, um, you know, whether it's through work co-ops, internships, um, startup companies, that kind of stuff. Uh, we do ask every applicant to come up with two letters of reference as well. So we're going to be, there'll be anonymous references and uh, you'll have to have those to complete your application. We need official transcripts for undergraduate institution. Uh, even if uh, your in undergraduate institution was not in Canada, we're still going to need official transcripts from your university. And again, this is one of those bottleneck things where people take a long time um, to get a transcript from certain institutions around the world. So, um, you know, start that process early. Um, but you can really start your application just with a resume and a cover letter. Right. And then uh, once you submit those to us, then we can actually convert what we'll call your inquiry into an application. And then um, and then once your application is complete, then we'll do a full interview. Um, and this is another thing that comes up quite often is the GMAT. Right. Don't start the GMAT. Uh, I want you to talk to us first because you might have enough experience and good enough undergraduate um, marks in those you know math and stats type courses um, to not have to worry about the GMAT. The GMAT can take a very long time for you to study and to write it effectively and get a good grade. Um, so we, you know, I, I, my personal opinion is that I'd rather you be studying how to program in Python and SQL and understanding statistics specifically than writing the full GMAT. Okay, so what happens then? So you come along, you, you submit your resume, uh, and maybe an unofficial transcript just to get started. Once we have that information, then we'll, we'll make that conversion from you to be a, an inquiry into an applicant. Um, there's no fee to apply to this program, and there's no cutoff deadlines or anything like that. So we, this is what we call rolling admission. So as soon as you send in that you know, unofficial transcript and a resume, we'll make you an applicant will assign you an application advisor. And in this case, and this year it's, it's Betsy Smith who's answering the questions on the Q&A. Uh, Betsy will work with you and she will look at your transcript, your resume, and maybe your LinkedIn profile. And she will give an honest, quick assessment of saying, okay, you know what? You've got some weak spots here or you're good to go. Um, let's push this through. And so she'll work with you and guide you throughout the entire process. And um, Betsy becomes your sort of advocate in this. Uh, she, you know, she wants you to be successful and to get admission to the program. And so she'll make sure that you understand exactly what you need to do to make your application as strong as possible. And then this, uh, without having any cutoff dates in this rolling admission that we do, really the last day, um, you know, we fill up um, the programs very quickly. And so for MMA Blended, uh, the program doesn't start until January, but we were actually running a wait list by the end of October. And so it's really important to make sure you get your application in there as quickly as possible to get into the program um, because they do fill up and we do have these wait lists. And unfortunately, especially for blended, uh, you'll have another you know, 14 months to wait before you can actually start the next year's program. So, so this is why, you know, start now. It may seem like uh, blended start dates a long ways away, um, but I would start as quickly as possible. And in particular for MMA Toronto, the spring cohort that starts in April, um, you know, we, we're now less than or almost exactly four months away from that. So uh, it's important to get that thing started quickly. Okay, now some of you may have discovered uh, the MITx, the Micro Masters Program in Statistics and Data Science. Um, this is called uh, what they what, what they call a pathway into our MMA program. Uh, this is something we worked out with uh, MIT many years ago. Um, you know, encouraging people to sort of start the program online and then being able to move into the MMA program. Uh, it does give you advanced credit for two courses, so our introduction to analytical modeling and, predict and predictive modeling, and it will ultimately or be a reduction in your program fees for us if you choose to do this. But, and this is my sort of off the record caution to you, um, is that this micro master's program to complete it actually takes two years to complete. 
Um, it's in US dollars, so it's quite expensive to do. Um, whereas you can do the full MMA program in 12 months and we pay in Canadian dollars. And so, you know, your return on your investment of doing uh, the micro master's program before our program, uh, it's not really there anymore. Um, you know, we, we'd hoped that it would be there and would work out pretty well, but uh, realistically, I think, you know, if, if you if you do the math, um, it doesn't make much sense to spend two years in that program plus a year in our program to get the same degree that you could just take in 12 months. Okay, especially now that we've got the blended program and you could be in the United States and, and you know, jump into our program itself. So, so anyway, something to think about. Um, the MicroMasters is a very good program. Um, I helped to vet those courses myself and they're, they're top notch. Uh, so I don't want to say that this isn't a good program. It just uh, cost effective wise, it's not the greatest. And speaking of costs, so the 2023 fees for the program. So domestic um, program fees is $43,840 Canadian dollars. International is 79,900 Canadian. Um, now these are what we call program fees. So they include all your tuition fees, but also all your books and learning materials meals and accommodations during our um, in-person sessions, all the software licenses for like Databricks and Snowflake that you're talking about, all that stuff is included in that single fee, okay? And to make things a little bit easier, you know, we do have a deposit of $2,000 as due before you get enrolled in a program. And then the remainder of that money is split into three installment payments over the course of a year. Okay, and if you're looking for financing options, um, there is the RBC student line of credit for domestic students. Um, in my experience and my, you know, talking to students and things, um, generally you get the best deal with your own bank. So if you've already got a history with like Scotiabank or TD Bank, um, you know, apply to them as well as RBC. Make sure you, you know, apply to a bunch, see what kind of uh, opportunities are out there, and uh, you might be able to play them off one another to get a better deal. Uh, this, these program MMA is, is OSAP eligible as well. So if you're in Ontario or another province in Canada, uh, make sure you apply for the student assistance program in your province because um, it is eligible for that. And uh, we do hear about students being successful getting uh, loans or grants through, um, you know, Vancouver or British Columbia and Alberta and stuff specifically. Um, but I've also worked with people in the government of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick as well to make sure that it's uh, it's approved through there. So we should be all set. Uh, and RSP borrowing in Canadian or Canada, the lifelong learning plan, tuition tax credits, and that kind of stuff. So take, do your due diligence, take a look at all these opportunities for helping you with the financing. And uh, don't forget about your company and your employer. You know, you should you may want to talk to them. Um, generally, companies do seem to be um, pretty happy about, you know, uh, providing you some financing to take this program. But there's always a hook on that, right? They're always going to want you to stick around for two or three years or four years after that. And so, again, that's something that you need to think about and um, need to, uh, you know, develop a plan and figure out what your best ROI is going to be in taking the program. Um, there are a few uh, scholarship opportunities. There's not a lot because this is a professional master's program. Um, but uh, we do have entrance scholarships to encourage Black and Indigenous students to join our program. And there's also uh, the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence Scholarship. Um, there's not, uh, there's only like one or two of those each year. So um, don't consider that to be part of your financing plan that you're going to get that scholarship. Uh, it's only going to be for like two or three people out of uh, a couple hundred. So um, it's extremely competitive. But if you think you've got good grades and you think you've got a good package, uh, I definitely encourage you to go for that scholarship. Okay. And ultimately, you know, and I'm bringing it back full circle, but this is about business. Okay. We are business school. We know that business value is derived through analytics and the discovery of those insights that really help businesses make their decisions um, to remain competitive and uh, profitable. Um, analytics will never work, right, without those power skills, right? You can, like I said, you can do the best analysis in the world. You can create the best computer program in the world. 
Uh, but if you can't explain it and apply it and figure out how it's going to work for your organization, it's never going to fly. So when we're talking about analytics, we're talking about digital transformation stuff, all of these aspects, the vision of where you're going with this, the strategy of how you're going to do it, the leadership to make sure it happens, and the change management expectations are huge because you've got to be able to motivate people around you to support you. And you can't do it alone, right? So you got to be able to collaborate effectively with different types of people above you, below you, all around you. And only through those sort of aspects are you going to be able to build that digital culture that's really going to make your organization successful and help you be identified as a leader in digital, uh, which I think is what uh, everybody who takes this program really wants, because that's what we want for you as well to be uh, the next generation of leaders uh, in these new digitally transformed organizations. Okay, so then it comes down to you and are you ready to apply? Um, please go to this website, take a look at the requirements again. You can actually start your uh, start the inquiry right there, download a brochure, um, get some more information and uh, and you'll be all set. But I definitely encourage you to do this quickly um, because it is a very competitive program and uh, you know we don't want people. I, I had to deal with too many people who were sad <laughs> this past fall. Uh, when they found out that we had a wait list and we didn't really go through that wait list either. We went through some of it, but not a lot of it. And so a lot of disappointed applicants um, are going to have to wait a full year before they can start the program, the blended program um, next year. So uh, start that application as quickly as possible. And then if you want to continue the conversation as well, there's um, my uh, sort of contact information. I'm happy to hear from you. There's my email address and that QR code actually connects um, to my LinkedIn profile. So, you know, again, I encourage you to, uh, to click on that QR code and connect with me on LinkedIn. And um, we've got a pretty good network of, you know, well over 5,000 people now uh, in the analytics community who are, you know, lots of different people posting lots of different things. And it's a great opportunity to learn and to connect and to network with uh, the analytics community, not only in Canada, but around the world as well. Okay, and that is the end of the presentation part. Now, let's see, I'm going to pop over to the Q&A, and we'll just take a look at this and see what they say. Okay, so Ling Fang says, is the business degree with business systems analyst experience also applicable for this program? Um, yeah, so as long as, you know, as long as you've got that sort of math and stats in there, um, you know, and you have some programming skills to go with it as well. <clears throat> you know, I think that that um, lends itself really well, like a business, probably about mm, almost half of our students and applicants uh, come with a business background. Okay. And Junaid says, is there a capstone project? So. There's a couple of different things. So the MMA blended program does have an optional capstone project at the end of the program. So basically you take the program from January to December. If you're interested in doing a capstone, you can do that from the January to April the following year. Um, we also have, and this is something that again, uh, is sort of out of our control, but in the past year, a couple of years, we've had um, my tax, uh, business strategy initiative internships, so BSI internships, uh, which if you're from outside of Ontario, you've probably heard of them. Uh, unfortunately, there's uh, been a bit of a, a negotiation, I think, between my tax and the Ontario government. So they're not actually offering them today in Ontario, but they were up until September. So we're hoping that that program gets back on track as of um, May of this year or April of this year. Um, but again, it comes down to budgets and stuff like that. But what the my tax, the reason I bring this up is, is if you do a capstone project, then you have to pay Smith to take it, right? And we give you faculty support and all that kind of stuff. If you do a my tax BSI, my tax actually pays you. Um, and so you'll get the same kind of four month 
real world experience to work on a project with a company and get paid for it. So this is why, you know, I bring that up now because it's a much better alternative than doing a capstone project alone. Um, but I do have a number of students in the blender program doing capstones uh, right now uh, with a number of companies. And again, we try to link you up with companies that are close to you geographically. So we've got, you know, capstones in Vancouver, uh, Calgary, and throughout Ontario as well. Okay. Can you please highlight some of the differences of MMA and MSC? So uh, there's they're, they're significantly different, right? So uh, MMA is a professional master's program that is ge geared towards professional people working full time. Uh, the MSC in management is a full time program. So you'd actually move to Kingston. Uh, you would be doing actual original research as well with a thesis. Um, and so that's sort of where you're going with an MSC management. So you can see it's quite different than what you take as a, a non-thesis professional master's program. Um, now, if you're interested in long-term goals of doing a PhD or something, we have had uh, a few MMA graduates who have gone into the PhD program. Uh, they do have to take some, you know, research fundamentals courses and before they can get into the PhD, um, but it is doable. So I, I, but, but very few, I think maybe seven people so far in the 10 years that we've been doing this have gone on to the PhD program. PhD again, full-time, right? You got to come to Kingston, you got to move here. Um, you're studying full time, and so you give up your jobs and things. And so again, you got to think about the uh, the return on your investment. Okay, how much does workshop weigh towards graduation? Uh, workshops are outside of the program. There's no academic value to these workshops. These workshops are purely about you developing your best self, um, whether they're about you know communication side or technical side. Um, those workshops are really about um, you and you developing your skills and abilities. Uh, do you teach any programming languages for fitting models or students just by theories? No, no. So, um, like I said, we do do Python programming and SQL programming in the pro in the courses itself. Um, and so you'll learn how to do that. Um, and we also ask you to take some online courses um, through Udemy or through Queens. We actually have our own courses now as well. Um, so you'll take those to make sure you understand how to program in Python before you go there. Um, but we'll we'll work with you to make sure about, you know, like you said, fitting models, accessing data, um, doing that kind of fun stuff. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing this right. It's Shyla or Sheila um, with the MBA from overseas. Um, definitely, we can take that offline and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about um, what you're doing, where you're going, uh, what kind of brokerage and finance you have here in Ontario, uh, and see if there's value for you to take the program for sure. Uh, will there be career events? Yeah, there's career events basically every month. Um, plus the, the career center and the coaches are available to you throughout the program as well. And so I definitely encourage you if you're thinking about developing your career or moving companies or even, you know, the other thing is we call it career. Um, it's not job searching, uh, but in the career environment, right? You're, you can develop a great career within one organization. And so if you are, uh, you know, working at a bank, for example, and you're currently a business analyst, let's say at Scotiabank, um, we have experiences and our coaches have experiences with understanding people who have moved up the ranks and getting promotions and becoming VPs uh, at the bank as well. But there's certain things that you have to do in order to be identified as a progressive employee. And so we can help you with that path to so make sure you're checking those boxes to say, hey, I've got this and I've got that. And so I'm preparing myself to become a VP or an executive VP, or even getting up to the C-suite, um, you know, there are coaches can help you with that. Uh, and Rohan says, what is the average salary after this course? So 
Um, that uh, again is you know a loaded question. Um, usually the salaries are dependent on the individual and certainly the location of where you're at, right? So um, average salaries are definitely six digits. Uh, there seems to be you know an increase for sure after you've taken the program, um, but it's really important to understand the time frame of that as well. Um, a lot of people switch jobs during the program. Uh, it's something I don't really encourage, but opportunity knocks and people take it. And so whenever you're negotiating for a new job, you can always negotiate appropriate salaries. I've seen some nice, uh, nice increases in people's salaries as well, um, especially nowadays when there's a lot of demand for analytics people. Um, but yeah, you should be able to expect, I would, you know, I'm not going to give you an actual number, but let's say, you know, three to five years after you've done the program, uh, you should be in a solid six digit salary situation. Uh, how much emphasis does the program have on SQL and Python? So, uh, Peter, that's a great question, and it's changing all the time. And I don't know if you know about, um, as for an example, Databricks. Um, Databricks allows you to have a graphical user interface, so you can drag and drop. And then there's this beautiful button in, uh, in Databricks that you can just click on, and you'll see the actual Python code um, derived from your graphical interface. So um, there is, there's definitely emphasis on SQL and Python because it's really important for people to understand how to code, what it takes to code, and the resources involved with coding certain things. And so there is definitely um, assignments in SQL and Python that you will have to do, um, but the tools in today's society, in today's world, are becoming um, much more fluid, much more non-code based, right? So, um, but today uh, there is certainly an emphasis on SQL and Python. Is there any career success report of this program? So what I do um, when people ask me about that, go on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is everybody's resume and everybody's career progression. And you can easily do a quick search in LinkedIn, say graduates of Smith School of Business, MMA program. And you can literally see, you know, I've probably about 95% of all of our graduates. And you'll be able to see also um, the career progression of these people. What kind of jobs did they start with? Uh, when did they take the program? And what kind of jobs they have now and what is the time frame for that right so like i said you know um i wouldn't think about career progression in you know six months after the program starts but think about it more about five years for after the finish the program um but you will also see the people who change jobs during the program right and it's fascinating to see uh what's going on out there and who gets hired um i I'm hazarding a guess, and this is sort of anecdotal, but um, probably about 80% of my students in the MMA blended program last year got new jobs um, before the program was over. Uh, so there's just, it's just opportunity knocks right now across Canada. So take, take a quick look uh, on LinkedIn and see what you see. Uh, the key difference between MMA and MMAI. Uh, so the key difference is uh, there's a far greater emphasis on technology in the MMAI program. MMAI, they have courses in natural language processing, deep learning. Uh, there's a very specific mathematics course for AI as well. And so um, you should have a much stronger technical background if you want to do the MMAI program than what you need with MMA. Okay, I have a, Ken has a strong background in R, would I still fit for the program? For sure. We are like tool agnostic in this program. Um, there will be uh, coursework, right? Then they're going to show you Python and Python code and all that kind of stuff. And that's what we've been working with. But if you can do your analysis in R, um, you know, that's okay too. Unless the professor specifically says, I want to see code in Python, um, you can use R for your analysis and whatever you're comfortable in. Um, but I also think it would be good for you to learn uh, learn the Python side. But if you have a strong background in R, then you already know how to program. 
you know what it takes, you know all those fundamental pieces. Um, but I would again encourage you to start thinking about uh, taking on some Python. Okay, I think that's it for, um, and we're uh, all the questions and answers and we're just past the time at 102. So again, thank you very much for joining me today and hopefully I'll see your application in our queue soon. Great, thank you very much and have a great one. Bye-bye.